Um, this is part two. We already started last week uh, this sermon on godliness, a great game. And we learned last week, basically, that uh, the message that we want to learn is that godliness is not a means of gain, but a great gain. Right? It is a great gain. Um, we touched last week on what godliness is not. Right? What is not godliness at all? And it is that we try to obey the Lord or we try to do the work of the Lord because our goal is really to gain money, to gain material things. We use the Lord in that way. We use the Lord so we can gain earthly things. Uh, that is not true godliness, right? And so we were clear last week that false teachers, there's one thing in common to them, and it is that they love money, right? They love money. Now, we'll be looking at the positive side, although there will still be negative things in here. And this would be our second point on this sermon. Godliness is a great gain, right? So we'll now be looking today on true godliness. We'll be focusing on verses 6 to verse 10, right? That's where we will be um, today. But here's the reality. How many have fallen from the faith because of the love for riches? How many uh, people who profess faith supposedly in the Lord Jesus Christ, but at some point of their life, they left the faith in pursuit in pursuit of money. Well, this is not surprising. Jesus himself uh, said regarding the heart which resembles the thorny soil, right? Remember the thorny soil where the seed, seed of the gospel fell? Jesus says the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches have kept the gospel from bearing fruit. Now that these people have been in church for quite some time, can even probably articulate the gospel and some important doctrines of the faith, but their hearts was never changed. They never learned to love the Lord. They never prized God more than anything else. They remained to be lovers of this world, lovers of money. How many have been in churches for the longest time but you realize they have never grown into Christ-likeness. And sometimes we wonder, what is the problem? We receive the same preaching on Sunday. We belong into the same small group. We read the same book together. What is the problem? Why are you gr not growing into Christ-likeness? And then we realize that it is because there is still nothing more important to most of them but the things of this world. This is sobering, isn't it? At least this calls us to, to examine our hearts and understand if, if I still love the things of this world more than God. We are living in a time when money, what it can do, is portrayed as everything. You know, people think that if you have money, you can do whatever you want, or you, you can get whatever you want, and you can do whatever you want to do. Tapos yung silent po na assumption is that, or parang nasa mind ng tao na mostly ang nag-iisip lang po nun yung mga hindi pa nila naranasan yung talagang maging mayaman. So thinking is that when I get the riches and I can do whatever what I want to do, I will be most happy and I will be most satisfied. Now that is the problem in the, in, in the time of Paul you read in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, about this co-worker of Paul by the name of Demas. And we are told in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, that Demas deserted Paul in the ministry. And not because he was sick, not because his parents were sick and he has to take care of them. We were told by Paul that, they, that he deserted Paul because he was in love with this present with this present world. And isn't this still the problem that we are facing today? 
And if it continues, this will continue to destroy the fake faith. Right? I'm not saying it will destroy a genuine faith. A genuine faith will never be destroyed. It will just show that somebody has a fake faith. And yes, I'm not saying, by the way, that Christians will never be guilty of loving the world. We, we love the world. But the scripture is also clear that, yes, at some point we struggle with loving the world and loving money and loving success. But the scripture calls us overcomers. We will overcome those struggles. And, and the problem today is that Satan has upped his game. Maybe at that time, if, if you do not want your faith to be destroyed, stay away from these false teachers. But this messaging is the messaging of the world today. Wherever you go, it is advertised. You look at in social media and you feel like their lives are perfect and your heart long run after. You imagine that oh, saya siguro ng buhay nila, lalo na pag nag-self-pity ka. Inisip mo, buti pa tong mga to, nagagawa nila yung, yung gusto nila. Pero ako, talagang ano lang tayo dito, uh, gulay-gulay. We see this in billboards. We see this practically everywhere today. Now, what we need today, if this is our situation, this is the time that we are living. What we need today is what Paul said here in verses 6 to 10. He made us understand the nature of earthly things in verses 6 to 8. And then he made us see the destructive consequences. The destructive consequences of loving the things of this world. In verses 9 and 10. But I believe the heart of Paul here in verses 6 to 10 is he is really trying to say the truth that contentment is not found on things. Contentment is found in God. This is what this is the message that he wants to drive home in verses 6 to 10. And I will circle around this idea today. Godliness with contentment is a great gain because it keeps us from the vain and faithful, faith-destroying pursuit of the things of this world. The only way we can keep ourselves, our idolatrous hearts, which quickly runs after the things of this world, is when we find godliness with contentment. The first thing I want us to see is that godliness with contentment will keep us from pursuing things that we will never keep. Right? Godliness with contentment will keep us from pursuing things that we will never keep. Isn't it crazy to pursue things which you and I know we will never be able to keep? Now, the book of Hebrews has a way of saying or calling this one. It says it is a chasing after the wind. And a chasing after the wind, or kung sa Tagalog parang naghahabol ka sa hangin, yun ba yun? Right. It's a proverbial way of saying it is foolishness. It is foolishness. It is not wrong to have things, but to live for the things of this world, the Bible is clear that it is foolishness. Now, we can be proud of it. We can, we can call it success. We can feel important if we have those things. But to live for this thing, meaning yun po yung buhay natin, which we will never be able to keep, by the way, because once you die, you will live everything, is foolishness. Foolishness not according to me. Foolishness not according to Confucius. Kasi confused na yun. Foolishness according to God. Foolishness according to Scripture. Now, it is important to note that the problem, again here, was a wrong theology on godliness as a means of gain. Right? Sisimba ako ngayon para talagang yayaman ako. 
Sisimba ko ngayon para talagang maging maging uh, successful yung aking aking business. Tapos nung hindi naging successful ang business, binabalikan ng Panginoon. Lord, nagsimba naman ako eh. They thought that to be a Christian is to be pros- prosperous financially. Somehow, Paul is showing in verses 6 to 10 that the problem with the theology that says godliness is a means of gain is that those who adhere to this theology would never find contentment. This is the problem. If, if, if our theology says godliness is a way to have all the things in this world, the problem with that is you will be miserable. You will be the most miserable person in the world because you are a person who never understands contentment, who never understands satisfaction, who is always pursuing and never arriving. Alam mo yon? Parati ka lang naghabol, tapos parati ka lang nag-iisip kung ang mind mo, kung makuha ko to, finally maging happy na ako, tapos nung nakuha mo, yun na naman. Uh, kung makuha ko yung next, ay, ako magiging happy. Parati mong hinahabol yung happiness and you never arrive. And you are miserable. We need to find contentment. Before we will deal with the practical problem of pursuing earthly things, we have to note that Paul's main concern here is the spiritual danger of the pursuit of earthly things. Na hindi lang po ito na parang empty ka, nagahabol ka ng things of this world. Paul says, no, there is a spiritual danger. And he is not apologetic. Orang hindi po nahihiya si Paul sabihin to. He was rather straightforward. And he said in verses 9 to 10 that it can lead to the destruction of your faith. Therefore, yung totoo pong believer, a true believer cannot make earthly things as their pursuit because when one does not learn to be content with what he has, he cannot keep himself from pursuing the world. When one does not have contentment, the world has so much to offer for us to resist. Right? And dami pong ino offer ng world is so hard to resist unless we find contentment. You see how important contentment is? Are you contented? When you look at your face in the mirror this morning, are you contented with what you saw? It's the reason why I believe verses 6 to 10 here really answers the question, why is godliness with contentment a great gain? Why is godliness with contentment a great gain? The first reason that Paul pointed out why godliness with contentment is a great gain is it keeps believers from the vain pursuit of earthly things to which no one can bring any of it with him when he dies. When he dies. It keeps us from that crazy pursuit. Though Job said, diba sabi ni Job, in Job 1.21, naked I came uh, from my mother's womb and naked will I depart. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 7, Paul, by using the word contentment, He's really using the word from the Stoics. He was not referring to Job, but the phrase of the Stoic. And by doing that one, ang ginagawa po dito ni Paul is he wants us to understand this basic truth, basic na basic po itong truth na to, that you do not have to be a believer to understand this truth. The Stoics understand this. The Stoic is saying, regardless of your, what your situation is, it doesn't matter if you have little or more. What's important is that you remain standing because anyway, when you die, you cannot bring anything with you. That's the Stoics. And today, diba? Kahit, kahit, you don't have to be a Christian. 
Either yung, yung isang believer na galit po sa family member kasi ha, hindi talaga tutulong. Kasabihin po natin na, na sige kasi hindi mo, mada, madadala mo naman yung pera mo sa langit. Huh? And we're saying, when you die, you cannot bring that with you. Or kaya naman po yung isang tao na kapag ka masyado siyang magastos, pag may pera siya, ginagastos niya po kaagad. And then you would ask, why do you spend? And you would say, well, anyway, I could not bring any of these things. My point is that you do not have to be a believer to understand this. This is very elementary. That's why Paul said, how can a believer fall into this trap? This is a basic truth about life. Have you ever given this a deep thought? Kumbaga, at some point, pinag-isipan mo ba talaga itong katotohanan po na ito na when you die, you cannot bring anything with you. Remember that we are not talking about having earthly things but living our lives in pursuit of it. And he, here's how we know if we're starting to live in pursuit of it. You are a little bit comfortable but you are not... You are not um, contented with that comfort, and then you desire for the next comfort. Nung una, banig-banig lang. Tapos, sana magkaroon nun lang ng foam. Na? Tapos, nung nag-foam na, parang nung napadaan sa all homes, parang maganda din, nung masarap yung ano. Right? Nag-start lang sa maliit na TV. Palaki ng palaki. And the world system is designed to cultivate it. Do you know that? Ang sistema na po ng mundo is to, is to cultivate this within us. One of the things I, I heard from the sports industry is that when one loses his selfishness, meaning wanting to have more, his career is over. I have heard a sports analyst Praising an athlete because after years of being an athlete, he still has the selfishness. They call it selfishness. Commitment is not a good word. Or, or sorry, content is not, sometimes it's not a good word in the world that we're living. One should never be content or else he will lose whatever he worked for. He should always desire for more. Now here are some messages from the world. Keep on dreaming. When you reach your vision, enlarge your vision. When you feel your barn, tear it down. Make a bigger one. Keep on pushing. Therefore, the next thing, because the world makes us run to this, like, treadmill. This is, this is the treadmill, and the world says, keep on running on that treadmill. The next time you know, you are on your deathbed. And practically speaking, you have been running all your lives in that treadmill that tells you, keep on pushing, keep on pursuing to get more. But, but hey, listen to me. It does not change the fact that not one of the earthly things you will gain, you will be bringing with you. Doesn't change the fact. Call it legacy, yeah. People will rejoice your legacy. But you left your legacy here. And I don't know where you are. Well, everyone applaud this in the time of Paul, in our time today. Paul says, let's do a real talk here. And if someone is asking, isn't this the perfect example of a tragic life in light of eternity? Living our lives in pursuit of things that we will never be able to keep. And they keep on pursuing things because they have never arrived. At contentment. Don't get me wrong, by the way. We are not saying that at some point we just have to start being complacent, losing our joy in our job, and the drive for excellence. Please don't get me wrong. 
Because we are called by God to honor Him by being excellent all the time, being joyful in our work all the time, and being productive in the work all the time. What we are saying here is that there is nothing more important to us than things so that we live our lives in pursuit of them, hoping that by having more of these things, we will finally find contentment. Are you daydreaming today? All right. I'll just get this job. You know. Are you still daydreaming? Uh, I'm, I'm not happy to burst your bubble, but I have to wake up. Contentment is not there. The next success? No, contentment is not there. The next thousand? Contentment is not there. The bigger house? Contentment is not there. Contentment is found in God. So how then can we keep ourselves from living our lives just to have more and more things in a world that promotes this kind of life? How can we keep ourselves? The answer, Paul's big answer is this, contentment. I want to ask two questions, at least in verses 6 to 8, and I want to answer it. What is contentment? And how can we have contentment? What is contentment and how can we have contentment? What is contentment? Contentment is a state of being satisfied, even with just the things that will ensure we continue to live. Right? Contentment means, even with just the thing, may makain ako today, I'm content. Tomorrow, I'm sure God will bring in the food. For as long as I can continue to live, that's what contentment, being satisfied. If we have something to eat and a place to live, we should be content. Obviously, this is true with us. When this is true with us, we live for something else. Right? When, when, when we are content with having something to eat and having a place to live, then we live not for the things of this world. We live for something else. We live for God. Have you ever tried that? Like, if, for example, you live for your family. Father's here. If you live for your family, sometimes yung mga tatay, kausap ko yung one pastor this week, and he said, you know what, pastor? I'm so content that ang wife ko nagagalit na dahil butas-butas na yung mga, mga damit niya. And he said, and the reason for that is that my heart is just, I'm thinking of my child. Alam yung mga tatay na parang okay na sa akin, wala ako basta. Basta yung anak ko, may gatas lang na mainom. You live for something else. You don't, you don't live for those things. But ultimately, you live for something else. Not just for your son, not just for your family. You live for God. That's the only way you can find contentment because life is no longer about what to eat or what to wear. Life is about God, and these things is just sustaining us so we can continue to live for God. In verse 8, Paul said, But if we have food and clothing, If we have food and clothing, with this, we will be content. Paul says we do not need more. Which is, by the way, this is not unique to Paul. You might say Paul is, is hardcore. He is so radical. We're not called to be Paul. But this is not unique to Paul. Remember the writer of the book of Hebrews, we read of him earlier. He said, keep your life from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 to 30 he said, do not worry about these things. Whatever you have, be content with it. Because you can trust that the, love of, that the Father loves you. 
Contentment is not something you think you have when you finally get enough. It is a present state of satisfaction. Now, I don't have to ask if you have a lot right now, you're satisfied with your job, you're satisfied with your bank account, you're satisfied with the, lit with the money you have. It is a present state of satisfaction regardless of how minimal things you have. Contentment is always a present reality and not a future fantasy. If you fantasize of contentment in the future, you'll never arrive. Contentment is always a present reality and not a future fantasy. How then can we have this contentment? Contentment is a state of being satisfied and secured because we have God. It is a state of being satisfied and secured because we have God. Now, if you look at the text, we cannot find any description that Paul said, but just that, godliness with contentment. And I think the word godliness there is the key to contentment. In fact, Paul, there's a debate here. Does it godliness leading to contentment or godliness characterized by contentment? Whichever way you go, uh, God, if there's true godliness, it will be characterized by contentment. If there's true godliness, it will lead you to contentment. And we already learned last week that the theology of the false teacher has money at the center, which only leads to the endless pursuit of money. What then is the center of true godliness? This is the big question. What then is the center of true godliness? I will call godliness God-centeredness. True godliness does not have money at the center. True godliness does not have, like, you worship God, but you love money. That's not, that's not godliness. Godliness is treasuring God. Godliness is having God at the center of our hearts. And this is true because contentment, again, can only be found in God. Matthew 6, 25, 23, Hebrews 13, 5, Philippians 4, 13, 13, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 to 10, all of this. Paul said, here's my secret. He said, I learned to be content. And then Paul said, here's my secret of being content. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The writer of the book of Hebrews says, do you know what, how to be content with what you have? Is it ground your life in the love of God. Trust that God loves you and he will never leave you nor forsake you. Contentment is found in God. And listen, the gospel does not make us fall in love with things. Like, I understand the gospel now. That's why I love things. The gospel makes us fall in love with Christ, with God and Christ. This is, this is what understanding who Jesus Christ is and what he has done in the cross. He, he brings us to God. He reconciles us back to God. He makes us understand who God is so that the center of our thoughts is God. We did not understand the gospel. So we will be entangled with things, but to run the race with endurance by looking unto Jesus. The gospel sets our eyes again to God. The gospel sets our eyes who used to see nothing. Our eyes, the eyes of our hearts used to see nothing but the things of this world. But when we understand God, finally, finally, our hearts are able to see God once more. Godliness with contentment is a great gain because its gain is not the world, but God. 
Let me say that again. Godliness with contentment is a great gain because its gain is not the world, but God. And it is a great gain because when God becomes the center of our thoughts, hearts, and life, meaning we fear him, we are rested and contented. We become more than just stoics. No, yung mga stoic whose aim in life is just to make sure that they do not crumble with life's pressure, with life's pressure. Though they are lifeless, worried, and afraid within. Maybe that's us. We're like stoics. We're just resisting to crumble under life's pressure, but we are dry, lifeless, and discontented with it. We're not stoics. We do not run after things, but after God, because we are already assured and at peace with Him. We are not like those who use godliness to gain riches because they feel worthless, not secure, and insignificant without it. We are satisfied, secured, and valued by God so that we are contented and rested regardless of how little that we have. This is why Paul said, godliness characterized by contentment. Because no one could not have, would have contentment or sorry, because one could not not have contentment when his life is centered on God. I don't know. I don't know if it, I'm sorry. If your heart is centered, if our heart is centered on God, then we should have content. Show me a person that is discontented, and I will tell you a person whose life is not centered on God. No gray area. No gray area. Godliness with contentment is a great gain because it keeps us from living our lives in pursuit of things that we can never keep. Diba po? Parang kabaliwan naman po yun na namumuhay ka, na mag-hoard ka, na mag-hoard. Punuin mo nang punuin yung bank account mo. O kung ano man sa bahay, kung hoarder ka, hindi ka na makagalaw kasi ang dami mong nilalagay sa bahay. Wala ka naman talagang madadali. It's, 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 just, it's just foolishness. We will waste our lives pursuing this world. Ang, ang buhay mo pala po, for all we know, palit po yan ang palit every day. And so we're wasting our lives pursuing this world when we do not find contentment in God. And we cannot keep ourselves from loving this world when we do not have God center our lives on Him and find our contentment in Him. And hear me out, church. It is not simply saying no to be in control. Let me put it in the context because ang problema natin ngayon social media. So allow me to use that. It is not simply saying no to being controlled by social media. It is finding our contentment in God that we will lose our love for this world. And in that way, we will not be carried away by this world. I'm saying if you are just trying to put your cell phone away, saying no to it. No, if you don't cultivate your love for God, if you don't go to his scripture and fix your eyes on the Lord, you cannot keep yourself. That's too powerful for you. The second reason why godliness with contentment is a great gain is this. Godliness with contentment will keep us from loving money, which could not keep us. Right? Have all the money you have, but it cannot keep your soul. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9 to 10, 
again, Paul said. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, and to many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money, by the way, not just the love of money, it did not say for the love of money is the root, meaning it's just the root, but one of the roots of all kinds of evil is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many punks. So Paul is saying there, love for money, though, po, will swerve itong mga tinatawag na believer from the faith and be destroyed by the Lord at the end of the day. And we will only understand Paul's words here if we see the goal that Paul implied. Obviously, ang ini-imply dito ni Paul, bakit kailangan matutunan natin yung godliness with great contentment, is because every Christian should finish the race. We should finish the race. While we might have been saved by faith, let us not forget that genuine faith endures to the end. Right? Hindi natin pwedeng sabihin sa Lord, Lord, nanawala naman ako sa'yo for 10 years eh. Di ba counted yun? Nawala naman ako sa'yo, Lord, for 15 years din yun ha. And it was only later on, 5 years na lang remaining in my life that I turned and disowned Christ. Di ba counted yun, Lord? Remember that Jesus said that those who endure to the end will be saved. And the writer of the book of Hebrews wrote a whole book for one reason. And that those true believers will endure to the end. For Paul, the desire to be rich in verse 9 and the love of money in verse 10, the same, is a root where other evil things grow from. Very clear, the, the, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. One will compromise because of money, isn't it? Nung hindi ka sana sinungaling, pero doing, nung nakita mong kikita ka, nagsinungaling ka na lang. One will sacrifice relationship because of money. One will even sacrifice his reputation or career or family because of money. Now, this is the reason why Paul said here, because if you love money, every opportunity to gain money becomes a temptation and a snare that you can fall into. Buti na lang to pre-niche. Let me say this one. The culprit of the death of family members and others at the end of the story is Bitina. Yung iba, ano yun? <laughs> For those of you who watch, can't, be, can't buy me love, you can follow. And who, who was able to, I think you need you not. not. <laughs> For those of you who followed and you were like surprised at the end of the, of the, of the teleserie, and you never guess. And I like it. It's a very beautiful illustration because he said that, you know, he, he killed, or she, she killed divine, she killed a lot of people, all because he wants, she wants GLC. It is all about money. I hope this is only happening in movies. But sadly, this is happening in real life. The, the lesson of the story is not watch the latest teleserie. That's not what we're talking about here. I'm sure Paul had in mind Hymenaeus Alexander in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20, who might have left the faith as well because of money and false teaching. Later on in his second letter, he made mention again of Demas, who deserted him because he was in love of this present world. When Paul looked at that situation, Demas 
deserting the Lord because of present world. It's more than just Bettina killing every family member or killing people for the sake of money. For Paul, this is more senseless. He, he could not understand it. If you could not understand, why would you kill a family member for money? For Paul, why would you left the faith for money? And li listen, he said, this is senseless. You see the word that he used in verse 9? He said, this is senseless. I could not understand this one. How can you left the faith for the sake of money? And it is also senseless because Paul said, this is senseless. I could not understand this because this will only lead to harm. He already said in verse 9 that this will result to plunging people into ruin and destruction. He further explained this in verse 10b saying, it is through this craving, the craving for money, that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves. With many pounds. It is senseless, not because it will harm them in this life. This is senseless because this will make them suffer forever in hell, away from God. When your pursuit of money or with your pursuit of money, you will end up nothing with nothing but your own destruction. I'm not saying we are all working, and of course we work so that we will have money. So let me again be very clear. This is about living for these things, making money our God. Do you see what Paul said? That godliness with contentment is a great gain. Do you see that? Why is it great gain? Because it will keep you from living a life that will only lead you to destruction. It keeps us from the love of money. Do you hear that? It keeps us from the love of money. Look at that. This is simply, this is not simply talking about changing our actions. This is talking about changing our hearts. We can change our actions, but can you really change your heart? Can, can you change, can you, can you tell your heart, be happy? Or for the women, na meron pong nanliligaw po sa inyo, but you, you want to love that person, pero hindi talaga eh. Can you tell your person, I love that person? What we have here is not a simple thing to do, but an impossible thing that only God can do. To have our hearts centered on God will happen or never happen unless we understand the love of God in Christ Jesus is better than life. I think Paul is talking about this should happen because you understand the gospel. It takes the Holy Spirit to make us understand what Jesus on, did on the cross. Or what Jesus did on the cross is the most beautiful thing that a hopeless, held down sinner would ever see in his life. Understand this, you are a sinner and you finally realize that you are held down and you are hopeless. And you see hope. Isn't this the most beautiful thing? It means we have understood that we did not just mystically appear into this world finally, but we finally understand that we have been created by God. And we know that even if we would not think about it, that I am created by God, deep in our hearts we will begin to understand that we will still answer God one day. And the thought Yung thought po that we will stand before God one day as a sinner will begin to make us cringe in fear. Alam mo yun, yung nangangatog sa takot. Because we have finally understood that the God who created us demands punishment for every sin we committed. Which 
we have finally accepted that we did not only sin against God, but we are a sinner to the core. And we have come to the realization that we're doomed. And we can never run from it. You can never run from God. David said, even if I go to the deepest sea, to the highest mountain, or to inside the cave, to the darkest place, can you really run from God? But while despairing, may you might be thinking, then I'm this in despair as I look at myself, nakakaawa yung situation, and I cannot do anything to change the situation. Finally, you saw your hope. Finally, you see and you understand that someone who is not of this world came into this world by becoming like us, a man, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is both God and man. And he perfected what, he could, what we could not, we could not only make, but we're not even concerned. We're not even concerned of obeying the Lord back then. More so obeying God perfectly. And though Jesus perfected obedience for us, he voluntarily took our place and was condemned for us. Therefore, we see that man hanging on the cross. We see that man hanging on the cross. As our only hope. Therefore, a person who sees Christ as his only hope would not care to leave everything behind. The only thing he cares is to run to him who can save him. He saw the cross, or we will see the cross as more beautiful than anything of this world. Did you understand the gospel of Jesus Christ? Because if we really saw the man hanging on the cross as our only hope, then nothing is more precious and more beautiful than him. You see, no one will keep himself from loving the money if he does not see him, the Lord Jesus, who is infinitely more beautiful, not only more beautiful than money, but even of life itself. He now understands why the psalmist says in Psalm 63 verse 3, when the psalmist says, your steadfast love is better than life. Church, we have seen him who is beautiful. We have seen him who is priceless. We have seen him who cannot be bought by money. We have seen him paying something that no, nothing in this world can ever pay. How then can these things in this world be our pursuit instead of him who died for you in the cross of Calvary? Godliness with contentment is a great gain because it keeps us from the vain and faith-destroying pursuit of the things of this world. See, knowing God through Jesus Leading us to contentment is a great gain for we could not resist this world leading to our destruction apart from knowing Christ and loving God. See, what we need to do is our gaze on God should get stronger every day so that our hearts will no longer easily wander to the things of this world. Have you ever noticed that? Nagbabasa ka ng Bible, nag-rip pa yun, siya. So, kinuha mo yun. And then, titingnan mo lang kung nag-rip pa na ba yung tinext mo. 
Just later, the next time you know, 10 minutes ka na doon. And then, nung 10 minutes na, sabi mo, ba't nga ako nandito? You don't, you have even forgotten why you went to the cell to check your cell phone. Our heart easily veers away. What we need to do every day is to get God's word. And as the writer of the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 5.14 says, train your discernment and continue to, to choose what is good. Because as you do it, your gaze in the Lord will be strengthened. You will not easily turn to the things of this world. Back to our big idea. Godliness is not a means of gain, but a great gain. There is nothing greater than seeing ourselves gazing upon the Lord. That is true gain. That is something you need to be grateful to God when you see your heart gazing upon the Lord. In this side of heaven, there is nothing greater than that. I don't care if you did not get the success. I don't care if you lose money. I don't care if you lose a relationship. Once you find yourself, once you find your heart gazing upon the Lord. You are better than 99% of this world. The only one who can be better than you are those whose hearts are gazing upon the Lord. We should reject then the prosperity gospel teaching because it is a distortion of biblical godliness. Making it a means instead of the gain. So.